Leviathan, were the matter, for me and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil. Book by Thomas Hobbes. Narrated by Andrew. Originally published in 1651. This is a great audiobook production, created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 36. Of the Word of God, and of Prophets. Word what? When there is mention of the Word of God, or of man, it doth not signify a part of speech, such as grammarians call a noun, or a verb, or any simple voice. Without a context or with other words to make it significative. But a perfect speech or discourse, whereby the speaker affirmeth, deneath, commendeth, promiseth, threateneth, wisheth, or interrogateth. In which sense it is not vocabulum that signifies a word, but sermo, in Greek logos, that is some speech, discourse, or saying. The word spoken by God and concerning God, both are called God's word in Scripture. Again, if we say the word of God, or of man, it may be understood sometimes of the speaker, as the words that God hath spoken, or that a man hath spoken. In which sense, when we say, the Gospel of St. Matthew, we understand Street Matthew to be the writer of it, and sometimes of the subject. In which sense, when we read in the Bible, the words of the days of the kings of Israel or Judah, tis meant, that the acts that were done in those days, were the subject of those words. And in the Greek, which in the scripture, retaineth many Hebraisms, by the word of God is oftentimes meant, not that which is spoken by God, but concerning God and his government. That is to say, the doctrine of religion, insomuch, as it is all one, to say logos theo and theologia. Which is, that doctrine which we usually call divinity, as is manifest by the places following, Acts 13.46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. That which is here called the word of God, was the doctrine of Christian religion, as it appears evidently by that which goes before. And, Acts 5.20, where it is said to the apostles by an angel, Go stand and speak in the temple, all the words of this life, by the words of this life, is meant, the doctrine of the gospel. As is evident by what they did in the temple, and is expressed in the last verse of the same chap. Daily in the temple, and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Christ Jesus, in which place it is manifest, that Jesus Christ was the subject of this word of life. Or, which is all one the subject of the words of this life eternal, that our Savior offered them. So, Acts 15.7, the word of God, is called the word of the gospel, because it conteneth the doctrine of the kingdom of Christ, in the same word, Rom. 10.8.9, is called the word of faith, that is, as is there expressed, the doctrine of Christ come, and raised from the dead. Also, Matt. 13.19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, that is, the doctrine of the kingdom taught by Christ. Again, the same word is said, Acts 12. 24. To grow and to be multiplied, which to understand of the evangelical doctrine is easy, but of the voice or speech of God, hard and strange. In the same sense the doctrine of devils signifieth not the words of any devil, but the doctrine of heathen men concerning demons and those phantasms which they worshipped as gods. 1 Tim. For point 1. Considering these two significations of the word of God, as it is taken in scripture, it is manifest in this later sense, where it is taken for the doctrine of the Christian religion. That the whole scripture is the word of God, but in the former sense not so. For example, though these words, I am the Lord thy God, etc. to the end of the Ten Commandments, were spoken by God to Moses. Yet the preface, God spake these words and said, is to be understood for the words of him that wrote the holy history. The word of God, as it is taken for that which he hath spoken, is understood sometimes properly, sometimes metaphorically. Properly, as the words he hath spoken to his prophets, metaphorically, for his wisdom, power, and eternal decree, in making the world. In which sense, those fiats, let there be light, let there be a firmament, let us make man, etc. Gen 1, are the word of God. And in the same sense it is said, John 1.3. All things were made by it, and without it was nothing made that was made, and pep. 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19
He upholdeth all things by the word of his power, that is, by the power of his word, that is, by his power, and heb. 11.3 The worlds were framed by the word of God. In many other places to the same sense, as also amongst the Latines, the name of fate, which signifieth properly the word spoken, is taken in the same sense. Secondly, for the effect of his word. Secondly, for the effect of his word, that is to say, for the thing itself, which by his word is affirmed, commanded, threatened, or promised. As Psalm 105.19, where Joseph is said to have been kept in prison, till his word was come, that is, till that was come to pass say which he had, Jin. 40.13, foretold the Pharaoh's butler, concerning his being restored to his office, for thereby his word was come, is meant, the thing itself was come to pass say. So also, one king. 18.36, Elijah saith to God, I have done all these thy words, instead of, I have done all these things at thy word, or commandment, and ja. 17.15, where is the word of the Lord, is put for, where is the evil he threatened, and Isaac. 12.28, there shall none of my words be prolonged any more. By words are understood those things, which God promised to his people. And in the New Testament, Matt. 24.35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. That is, there is nothing that I have promised or foretold that shall not come to pass say. And in this sense it is, that St. John the Evangelist, and, I think, St. John only calleth our Savior himself as in the flesh, the word of God is Joe. 1.14. The word was made flesh, that is to say, the word, or promise that Christ should come into the world, who in the beginning was with God. That is to say, it was in the purpose of God the Father, to send God the Son into the world, to enlighten men in the way of eternal life, but it was not till then put in execution. And actually incarnate, so that our Savior is there called the Word, not because He was the promise, but the thing promised. They that taking occasion from this place, though commonly call Him the Verb of God, do but render the text more obscure. They might as well term Him the noun of God. For as by noun, so also by verb, Men understand nothing but a part of speech, a voice, a sound, that neither affirms, nor denies, nor commands, nor promiseth, nor is any substance corporeal or spiritual, and therefore it cannot be said to be either God or man, whereas our Savior is both. And this word which St. John in his Gospel saith was with God, is in his one epistle, verse 1, called the word of life. And verse 2, the eternal life, which was with the Father so that he can be in no other sense called the Word, than in that, wherein he is called eternal life. That is, he that hath procured us eternal life, by his coming in the flesh. So also, Apocalypse 19.13, the apostle speaking of Christ, clothed in a garment dipped in bloud, saith, his name is the Word of God. Which is to be understood, as if he had said his name had been, he that was come according to the purpose of God from the beginning and according to his word and promises delivered by the prophets, so that there is nothing here of the incarnation of a word, but of the incarnation of God the Son, therefore called the word. Because his incarnation was the performance of the promise, in like manner as the Holy Ghost is called the promise. Acts 1.4 Luke 24.49 Thirdly, for the words of reason and equity. There are also places of the scripture, where, by the word of God, is signified such words as are consonant to reason, and equity, though spoken sometimes neither by prophet, nor by a holy man. For Pharaoh Necho was an idolater. Yet his words to the good king Josiah, in which he advised him by messengers, not to oppose him in his march against Carchemish, are said to have proceeded from the mouth of God. And that Josiah, not hearkening to them, was slain in the battle, as is to be read to Kron. 35. There. 21. 22, 23, it is true, that as the same history is related in the first book of Esdras, not Pharaoh, but Jeremiah spake these words to Josiah, from the mouth of the Lord. But we are to give credit to the canonical scripture, whatsoever be written in the Apocrypha. The word of God, is then also to be taken for the dictates of reason, and equity, when the same is said in the scriptures to be written in man's heart, as Psalm 36.31. Jerem. 31.33. Deuteronomy 30.11, 14. In many other like places.
divers accept tines of the word prophet. The name of prophet signifieth in scripture sometimes prolocutor, that is, he that speaketh from God to man, or from man to God, and sometimes preedictor, or a foreteller of things to come. And sometimes one that speaketh incoherently, as men that are distracted. It is most frequently used in the sense of speaking from God to the people. So Moses, Samuel, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and others were prophets. And in this sense the high priest was a prophet, for he only went into the sanctum sanctorum to inquire of God and was to declare his answer to the people. And therefore when Cephas said, it was expedient that one man should die for the people, St. John Seth Chap. 11.51 That he spake not this of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that one man should die for the nation. Also they that in Christian congregations taught the people. 1 Cor 14.3 Are said to prophecy. And the like since it is, that God saith to Moses, Exodus. For point one six Concerning Aaron, he shall be thy spokesman to the people, and he shall be to thee a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. That which here is spokesman, is chap 7.1. Interpreted prophet. See saith God, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. In the sense of speaking from man to God, Abraham is called a prophet genes. 20.7 Where God in a dream speaketh to Abimelech in this manner, Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and shall pray for thee. Whereby may be also gathered, that the name of prophet may be given, not improperly to them that in Christian churches have a calling to say public prayers for the congregation. In the same sense, the prophets that came down from the high place or hill of God, with a psaltery and a tabret, and a pipe, and a harp, one Sam. 10.5.6, and Ver. 10. Saul amongst them, are said to prophecy, in that they praised God, in that manner publicly. In the like sense, is Miriam Exodus. 15.20, called a prophetess. So is it also to be taken, one C.O.R. 11.4.5, where St. Paul saith, Every man that prayeth or prophesieth with his head covered, etc. And every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, for prophecy in that place signifieth no more, but praising God in psalms and holy songs. Which women might do in the church, though it were not lawful for them to speak to the congregation. And in this signification it is, that the poets of the heathen, that composed hymns and other sorts of poems in the honor of their gods, were called Vates prophets, as is well enough known by all that are versed in the books of the Gentiles, and as is evident, Tit. 1.12, where St. Paul saith of the Cretans, that a prophet of their own said, they were liars. Not that St. Paul held their poets for prophets, but acknowledgeth that the word prophet was commonly used to signify them that celebrated the honor of God in verse. Preediction of future contingents, not always prophecy. When by prophecy is meant preediction, or foretelling of future contingents, not only they were prophets, who were God's spokesmen, and foretold those things to others, which God had foretold to them. But also all those impostors, that pretend by the help of familiar spirits, or by superstitious divination of events past, from false causes, to foretell the like events in time to come. Of which, as I have declared already in the twelfth chapter of this discourse, there be many kinds, who gain in the opinion of the common sort of men, a greater reputation of prophecy, by one casual event that may be but rested to their purpose, then can be lost again by never so many failings. Prophecy is not an art, nor, when it is taken for preediction, a constant vocation, but an extraordinary and temporary employment from God, most often of good men, but sometimes also of the wicked. The woman of Ender, who is said to have had a familiar spirit, and thereby to have raised a phantasm of Samuel, and foretold Saul as death, was not therefore a prophetess. For neither had she any science, whereby she could raise such a phantasm, nor does it appear that God commanded the raising of it. But only guided that imposture to be a means of Saul's terror and discouragement, and by consequent, of the discomfiture, by which he fell. And for incoherent speech, it was amongst the Gentiles taken for one sort of prophecy, because the prophets of their oracles, intoxicated with a spirit, or vapor from the cave of the Pythian oracle at Delphi, were for the time really mad, and spake like madmen, of whose loose words a sense might be made to fit any event, in such sort, 
as all bodies are said to be made of materia prima. In the scripture I find it also so taken, 1 Sam. 18, 10. In these words, and the evil spirit came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. The manner how God hath spoken to the prophets. And although there be so many significations in scripture of the word prophet, yet is that the most frequent, in which it is taken for him, to whom God speaketh immediately, that which the prophet is to say from him, to some other man, or to the people. And hereupon a question may be asked, in what manner God speaketh to such a prophet? Can it, may some say, be properly said, that God hath voice and language, when it cannot be properly said, he hath a tongue, or other organs, as a man? The prophet David argued with us, shall he that made the eye, not see? Or he that made the ear, not hear? But this may be spoken, not, as usually, to signify God's nature, but to signify our intention to honor him. For to see, and hear, are honorable attributes, and may be given to God, to declare, as far as our capacity can conceive, his almighty power. But if it were to be taken in the strict and proper sense, one might argue from his making of all parts of man's body, that he had also the same use of them which we have. Which would be many of them so uncomely, as it would be the greatest contumely in the world to ascribe them to him. Therefore we are to interpret God's speaking to men immediately, for that way, whatsoever it be, by which God makes them understand his will, and the ways whereby he doth this, are many. And to be sought only in the Holy Scripture, where though many times it be said, that God spake to this, and that person, without declaring in what manner. Yet there be again many places, that deliver also the signs by which they were to acknowledge his presence, and commandment, and by these may be understood, how he spake to many of the rest. To the extraordinary prophets of the Old Testament he spake by dreams, or visions. In what manner God spake to Adam, and Eve, and Cain, and Noah is not expressed, nor how he spake to Abraham, till such time as he came out of his own country to sick him in the land of Canaan. And then, Gen 12.7. God is said to have appeared to him. So there is one way, whereby God made his presence manifest, that is, by an apparition, or vision. And again, Gen 15.1. The word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, that is to say, somewhat, as a sign of God's presence, appeared as God's messenger, to speak to him. Again, the Lord appeared to Abraham, Chen. 18. 1. By an apparition of three angels, and to Abimelech, Chen. 20. 3. In a dream, to Lot, Chen. 19. 1. By an apparition of two angels, and to Hagar, Chen. 21. 17. By the apparition of one angel, and to Abraham again, Chen. 22. 11. By the apparition of a voice from heaven, and Chen. 26. 24. To Isaac in the night, that is, in his sleep, or by dream, and to Jacob, Jen. 18. 12. In a dream, that is to say, as are the words of the text, Jacob dreamed that he saw a ladder, etc., and Jen. 32. 1. In a vision of angels, and to Moses, Exodus. 3.2. In the apparition of a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And after the time of Moses, where the manner how God spake immediately to man in the Old Testament is expressed, he spake always by a vision or by a dream. As to Gideon, Samuel, Eliah, Elisha, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and the rest of the prophets. And often in the New Testament, as to Joseph, to St. Peter, to St. Paul, and to St. John the Evangelist in the Apocalypse. Only to Moses he spake in a more extraordinary manner in Mount Sinai and in the tabernacle, and to the high priest in the tabernacle, and in the sanctum sanctorum of the temple. But Moses, and after him the high priests were prophets of a more eminent place, and degree in God's favor. And God himself in express words declareth, that to other prophets he spake in dreams and visions, but to his servant Moses, in such manner as a man speaketh to his friend. The words are these, Num, 12. 6, 7, 8. If there be a prophet among you, I the Lord will make myself known to him in a vision, and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. And Exodus 33, 11. The Lord spake to Moses face to face, as a man speaketh to his friend. And yet this speaking of God to Moses, 
was by mediation of an angel or angels, as appears expressly, Acts 7, version 35 and 53, and Gal 3, 19. And was therefore a vision, though a more clear vision than was given to other prophets. And conformable hereunto, where God saith, D-U-T. 13. 1. If there arise amongst you a prophet or dreamer of dreams, the later word is but the interpretation of the former. And Joel 2. 28. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, where again, the word prophecy is expounded by dream and vision. And in the same manner it was that God spake to Solomon, promising him wisdom, riches, and honor. For the text saith, 1 Kings 3. 15. And Solomon awoke, and behold it was a dream. So that generally the prophets extraordinary in the Old Testament took notice of the word of God no otherwise than from their dreams or visions, that is to say, from the imaginations which they had in their sleep or in an ecstasy, which imaginations in every true prophet were supernatural, but in false prophets were either natural or feigned. The same prophets were nevertheless said to speak by the Spirit, as Zach. 7, 12, where the prophet speaking of the Jews, Seth, they made their hearths hard as adamant, lest they should hear the law. And the words which the Lord of hosts hath sent in his spirit by the former prophets, by which it is manifest that speaking by the spirit or inspiration, was not a particular manner of God speaking, different from vision, when they that were said to speak by the spirit were extraordinary prophets, such as for every new message, were to have a particular commission, or, which is all one, a new dream or vision. To prophets of perpetual calling and supreme, God spake in the Old Testament from the mercy seat, in a manner not expressed in the scripture. Of prophets, that were so by a perpetual calling in the Old Testament, some were supreme, and some subordinate, supreme were first Moses. And after him the high priest, every one for his time, as long as the priesthood was royal. And after the people of the Jews had rejected God, that he should no more reign over them, those kings which submitted themselves to God's government were also his chief prophets. And the high priest's office became ministerial. And when God was to be consulted, they put on the holy vestments and inquired of the Lord, as the king commanded them, and were deprived of their office when the king thought fit. For King Saul, 1 Sam, 13, 9, commanded the burnt offering to be brought, and 1 Sam, 14, 18, he commands the priest to bring the ark near him, and ver. 19. Again to let it alone, because he saw an advantage upon his enemies. And in the same chapter Saul asketh counsel of God. In like manner King David, after his being anointed, though before he had possession of the kingdom, is said to inquire of the Lord, 1 Sam. 23. 2. Whether he should fight against the Philistines at Keilah. And, verse 10. David commandeth the priest to bring him the ephod to inquire whether he should stay in Keilah or not. And King Solomon, 1 Kings 2, 27, took the priesthood from Abiathar and gave it, verse 35, to Zadok. Therefore Moses and the high priests and the pious kings, who inquired of God on all extraordinary occasions, how they were to carry themselves or what event they were to have, were all sovereign prophets. But in what manner God spake unto them is not manifest. To say that when Moses went up to God in Mount Sinai, it was a dream or vision, such as other prophets had, is contrary to that distinction which God made between Moses and other prophets, num. 12, 6, 7, 8. To say God spake or appeared as he is in his own nature, is to deny his infiniteness, invisibility, incomprehensibility. To say he spake by inspiration or infusion of the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit signifieth the deity, is to make Moses a qual with Christ, in whom only the Godhead, as St. Paul speaketh call 2.9, dwelleth bodily. And lastly, to say he spake by the Holy Spirit, as it signifieth the graces or gifts of the Holy Spirit, is to attribute nothing to him supernatural. For God disposeth men to piety, justice, mercy, truth, faith, and all manner of virtue, both moral and intellectual, by doctrine, example, and by several occasions, natural and ordinary. And as these ways cannot be applied to God, and is speaking to Moses at Mount Sinai, so also they cannot be applied to him, and is speaking to the high priests from the mercy seat.
Therefore in what manner God spake to those sovereign prophets of the Old Testament, whose office it was to inquire of him, is not intelligible. In the time of the New Testament, there was no sovereign prophet, but our Savior, who was both God that spake, and the prophet to whom he spake. To prophets of perpetual calling, but subordinate, God spake by the Spirit. To subordinate prophets of perpetual calling, I find not any place that prophet God spake to them supernaturally. But only in such manner, as naturally he inclineth men to piety, to belief, to righteousness, and to other virtues all other Christian men. Which way, though it consist in constitution, instruction, education, in the occasions and invitements men have to Christian virtues. Yet it is truly attributed to the operation of the Spirit of God, or Holy Spirit, which we in our language call the Holy Ghost. For there is no good inclination that is not of the operation of God. But these operations are not always supernatural. When therefore a prophet is said to speak in the Spirit, or by the Spirit of God, we are to understand no more, but that he speaks according to God's will, declared by the Supreme Prophet. For the most common acceptation of the word Spirit is in the signification of a man's intention, mind, or disposition. In the time of Moses, there were seventy men besides himself that prophesied in the camp of the Israelites. In what manner God spake to them, is declared in the eleven of Numbers, verse 25. The Lord came down in a cloud, and spake unto Moses, and took of the Spirit that was upon him, and gave it to the seventy elders. And it came to pass, say, when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, and did not cease, by which it is manifest, first, that their prophesying to the people, was subservient, and subordinate to the prophesying of Moses, for that God took of the Spirit of Moses, to put upon them so that they prophesied as Moses would have them, otherwise they had not been suffered to prophesy at all. For there was, verse 27, a complaint made against them to Moses, and Joshua would have Moses to have forbidden them, which he did not, but said to Joshua, Be not jealous in my behalf. Secondly, that the Spirit of God in that place signifieth nothing but the mind and disposition to obey, and assist Moses in the administration of the government. For if it were meant they had the substantial Spirit of God, that is, the divine nature, inspired into them, then they had it in no less manner than Christ himself, in whom only the Spirit of God dwelt bodily. It is meant therefore of the gift and grace of God that guided them to cooperate with Moses, from whom their spirit was derived. And it appeareth, verse 16, that they were such as Moses himself should appoint for elders and officers of the people. For the words are, Gather unto me seventy men, whom thou knowest to be elders and officers of the people. Where, thou knowest, is the same with thou appointest, or hast appointed to be such. For we are told before, Exodus 18, that Moses following the counsel of Jethro his father-in-law, did appoint judges and officers over the people, such as feared God. And of these were those seventy, whom God by putting upon them Moses' spirit, inclined to aid Moses in the administration of the kingdom, and in this since the spirit of God is said, 1 Sam. 16. 13, 14, presently upon the anointing of David, to have come upon David, and left Saul, God giving his graces to him he chose to govern his people, and taking them away from him, he rejected. So that by the Spirit is meant inclination to God's service, and not any supernatural revelation. God sometimes also spake by lots. God spake also many times by the event of lots, which were ordered by such as he had put in authority over his people. So we read that God manifested by the lots which Saul caused to be drawn, 1 Sam. 14. 43. The fault that Jonathan had committed, in eating a honeycomb, contrary to the oath taken by the people. In Josh. 18. 10. God divided the land of Canaan amongst the Israelite, by the lots that Joshua did cast before the Lord in Shiloh. In the same manner it seemeth to be, that God discovered, Joshua 7.16. Inc. The crime of Achan. And these are the ways whereby God declared his will in the Old Testament. All which ways he used also in the New Testament. To the Virgin Mary, by a vision of an angel. To Joseph in a dream. Again to Paul in the way to Damascus in a vision of our Savior. And to Peter in the vision of a sheet let down from heaven. With divers sorts of flesh, of clean and unclean, beasts. And in prison, by vision of an angel. And to all the apostles and writers of the New Testament by the graces of his Spirit. And to the apostles again, 
at the choosing of Matthias in the place of Judas Iscariot, by Lot. Every man ought to examine the probability of a pretended prophet's calling. Seeing that all prophecy supposeth vision or dream, which too, when they be natural, are the same, or some especial gift of God, so rarely observed in mankind, as to be admired where observed. And seeing as well such gifts, as the most extraordinary dreams and visions may proceed from God, not only by His supernatural and immediate, but also by His natural operation. And by mediation of second causes, there is need of reason and judgment to discern between natural and supernatural gifts, and between natural and supernatural visions or dreams. And consequently men had need to be very circumspect and wary in obeying the voice of man that pretending himself to be a prophet requires us to obey God in that way, which he in God's name telleth us to be the way to happiness. For he that pretends to teach men the way of so great felicity pretends to govern them, that is to say, to rule and reign over them, which is a thing that all men naturally desire and is therefore worthy to be suspected of ambition and imposture and consequently ought to be examined and tried by every man before he yield them obedience, unless he have yielded at them already in the institution of a commonwealth. As when the prophet is the civil sovereign, or by the civil sovereign authorized. And if this examination of prophets and spirits were not allowed to every one of the people, it had been to no purpose to set out the marks by which every man might be able to distinguish between those whom they ought and those whom they ought not to follow. Seeing therefore such marks are set out D.U.T. 13, 1, Inc. To know a prophet by, and 1 John 4.1. And C. To know a spirit by, and seeing there is so much prophesying in the Old Testament, and so much preaching in the New Testament against prophets, and so much greater a number ordinarily of false prophets, than of true, everyone is to beware of obeying their directions, at their own peril. And first, that there were many more false than true prophets appears by this, that when Ahab, 1 Kings 12, consulted 400 prophets, they were all false impostors, but only one Micaiah. And a little before the time of the captivity, the prophets were generally liars. The prophets saith the Lord by Jerem. Cha. 14. Verse 14. Prophecy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, nor spake unto them, they prophesy to you a false vision a thing of naught, and the deceit of their heart. And so much as God commanded the people by the mouth of the prophet Jeremiah, chap. 23, 16, not to obey them. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, hearken not unto the words of the prophets, that prophesy to you. They make you vain, they speak a vision of their own heart, and not out of the mouth of the Lord. All prophecy but of the sovereign prophet is to be examined by every subject. Seeing then there was in the time of the Old Testament, such quarrels amongst the visionary prophets, one contesting with another, and asking when departed the Spirit from me, to go to thee? As between Micaiah, and the rest of the four hundred, and such giving of the lie to one another, as in Jerem. 14.14 And such controversies in the New Testament at this day, amongst the spiritual prophets. Every man then was, and now is bound to make use of his natural reason, to apply to all prophecy those rules which God hath given us to discern the true from the false. Of which rules, in the Old Testament, one was, conformable doctrine to that which Moses the sovereign prophet had taught them. And the other the miraculous power of foretelling what God would bring to pass a, as I have already shown out of D.U.T. 13, 1, etc. And in the New Testament there was but one only mark, and that was the preaching of this doctrine, that Jesus is the Christ, that is, the King of the Jews, promised in the Old Testament. Whosoever denied that article, he was a false prophet, whatsoever miracles he might seem to work, and he that taught it was a true prophet. For St. John, 1 Epist, 4, 2, and speaking expressly of the means to examine spirits, whether they be of God or not. After he hath told them that there would arise false prophets, saith thus, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is of God that is, is approved and allowed as a prophet of God, not that he is a godly man, or one of the elect, for this, that he confesseth, professeth, or preacheth Jesus to be the Christ, but for that he is a prophet avowed. For God sometimes speaketh by prophets, whose persons he hath not accepted, as he did by Balaam, 
and as he foretold Saul of his death, by the witch of Ender. Again in the next verse, every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is not of Christ. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. So that the rule is perfect on both sides, that he is a true prophet, which preacheth the Messiah already come, in the person of Jesus. And he a false one that denieth him come, and Luke hath for him in some future impostor, that shall take upon him that honor falsely, whom the apostle there properly calleth Antichrist. Every man therefore ought to consider who is the sovereign prophet, that is to say, who it is, that is God's vice-regent on earth, and hath next under God, the authority of governing Christian men. And to observe for a rule, that doctrine, which in the name of God, he commanded to be taught. And thereby to examine and try out the truth of those doctrines, which pretended prophets with miracles, or without, shall at any time advance. And if they find it contrary to that rule, to do as they did, that came to Moses, and complained that there were some that prophesied in the camp, whose authority so to do they doubted of. And leave to the sovereign, as they did to Moses to uphold, or to forbid them, as he should see cause, and if he disavow them, then no more to obey their voice. Or if he approve them, then to obey them, as men to whom God hath given a part of the spirit of their sovereign. For when Christian men take not their Christian sovereign for God's prophet, they must either take their own dreams for the prophecy they mean to be governed by, and the tumor of their own hearts for the Spirit of God. Or they must suffer themselves to be lead by some strange prince. Or by some of their fellow subjects, that can bewitch them, by slander of the government, into rebellion, without other miracle to confirm their calling, than sometimes an extraordinary success. And impunity, and by this means destroying all laws, both divine and humane, reduce all order, government, and society to the first chaos of violence and civil war. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.